All right, uh, so today we are going to be discussing and talking about editing. Uh, last time we were here, we actually talked about and discussed framing um, and talked about how we can finalize like our storyboards and make our shots look the way we want them to look um, and, and kind of show off what our video is going to look like uh, before we actually even get a camera to go film your particular video, right? Um, so uh, today what I want to do is talk about what happens after you get those particular shots because you're not done once you start just filming and getting, getting your shots and bringing it in. You have to rearrange them. You have to put, thing, put things together to try and tell your particular story. So my question then today is, in, in your opinion, I'm going to have you guys talk this over with your group, what is editing and what is its purpose? Okay. If you don't know, uh, try and think of why one would edit something. And this isn't just to do, to do with videos. Why do you go back and edit a paper? Okay, what is the process of editing a paper? Is it different than writing? And if it is different than writing, how do those individual things differ in the way that they actually uh, approach that particular, uh, that, that particular idea? Okay, so I'm going to give you guys two minutes. We'll be back in, in a moment, and then you guys will be able to uh, answer that out. Producers, you'll assign someone in your group to answer for, your particular, uh, for this particular question today. Oh, that's loud. Oh, that's loud. All right, cool. So we're going to start with group two right there in the back really quick. Group two. Who'd you guys end up coming up with? Or what, what answer you guys, did you guys end up coming up with? Derek. Like editing, it's like making changes to make the video better. Okay, making changes to make the video better. What about like writing a paper and stuff like that? Does it still fall the same line? Yeah, kind of like fixing your mistakes. Okay. Good. Okay. Cool. Fair enough. Fixing your mistakes and also going back and uh, uh, checking uh, checking your marks. Group six. Kai. Kai, do you got it or no? No. Okay. Rajan, did you have it? Oh. Whoa. Or Jacob? Jacob got it. Okay. Cool. Well, that's okay. One of us will get it there eventually. So, like a paper, how you have a rough draft and a final draft, and you go through and edit a rough draft to reach a final draft. Good. Good, and that, that's, that's almost it exactly, and that's where I want to start for today, is it is the refinement. Derek was right when he was talking about fixing the, the little mistakes and fixing the little errors, but there's definitely a little bit more to it than just that, okay? So here's what editing fully is, okay? Um, and by the way, for us to really kind of understand editing, we have to talk about the story first. Uh, we just had, like I said, Hamish and Maggie McAllister in here. Um, they are um, individuals that uh, do mostly commercial um, products, but she's an actress and a producer. He is more of a director and uh, um, uh, cinematographer, uh, which is why he's able to bring stuff in. Uh, they always said that their editing starts specifically with story. Um, he, had a, he has a master's in writing from NYU, um, and one of the things that he was discussing and talking about in here specifically was that if you don't have that great idea, you can't utilize the tool to, uh, to enhance that idea. And so 
when it comes to editing, he was talking very much about story and how you need to have that, that account. You need to have things written down that are entertaining and trying to tell a lesson and embedded in there together. Because if you're not doing both, you're not going to be able to turn out the product that you, that you want to do. Okay? Uh, we then talked about how a script is used to take that idea to kind of narrow things down, but also fill out different segments, and those segments are called scenes. Right? Because you can go film one segment here, or you can shoot another segment here, and then bring it back in later on, and then realign them up when, it, when we actually uh, um, um, get, to, get to editing. Okay? Then we also talked about storyboarding, and how if you're going to go out and film particular shots, you need to make sure you have the right shots to go get. Because if you have no idea what kind of shots you're going to get, then there's kind of no point in you taking out the camera to go film what it is you're going to film. Right? And we talked about how when we go out to get the shots that we're going to get, we can frame them up by drawing them out on those, on those specific storyboards so that we have a better understanding of what it is that we're, we're trying to portray across to the viewer's eye and into their brains. Okay? Um, before we fully get into editing, I really kind of want to concentrate on, on why proper framing is important. Okay? Um, there is a difference between, because you guys saw up here when you guys were doing your presentations the last time uh, we were around, some groups had kind of the same shots set up. There were wide shots and wide shots and then wide shots. Then they go in for like a medium close and they go back out to a wide shot and wide shot and wide shot. Choosing your frames properly, understanding what, what the, each one of the major types of shots elicits, what kind of emotion it elicits, um, gives you a better understanding of the viewer and also gives you a better understanding of what the author is trying to say in a particular story. So in order to make sure that you're trying to get the correct emotions across, it's not just what's physically portrayed there. right? We want to make sure that, that we have our frames set up in such a way that we uh, elicit an emotional response. So framing actually establishes more the emotional aspects of a scene, not just the physical. Okay? And then it's the characters that interact upon that scene that give you the relational traits. And once you have physical, emotional, and relational traits, well, now you have a character. And so the more you understand the character, which then becomes the story at this point, the better your viewer and your audience is going to feel more, or sorry, not the better, the more attached your audience is going to feel to that particular character and attached to your story and your understanding of things. Okay. So, how a scene is framed or set up elicits an emotional response from a viewer. So, for example, I like to use the example of a funeral. Okay? If someone has just died, okay, an individual, old man, right? he was in a great war at some point, okay? but he was able to survive, and he goes and lives a long, happy, beautiful life, raising kids with his, with his family, uh, um, stays married to the same woman for 72 years, um, and, and never cheats, doesn't really do anything bad or anything else like that. Doesn't, literally, there's no one who has a bad word to say about him. Right? By the way, I'm describing my grandfather for those of you wondering, why is he being so specific? That was literally my grandfather's uh, uh, life story. Okay? No one literally had anything bad to say about him. Right? You get to the funeral and you see his widow grieving. Where do you put the camera? Okay, because there's two things that you can do, right? If, if you have a camera and you're filming this particular funeral and you're going to try and tell the story of this great man and you see this widow just whew, bawling, what do you do? Because you want to get the emotion across, and so if you want to get the emotion across, you'd probably zoom in or put the camera closer to her face. The problem is that if you're, you as the audience see this woman crying, you're going to feel uncomfortable because you're too close to this woman who's just bawling her eyes out, right? However, if you're too far away, you might miss the emotional response, and so you might not necessarily know what's going on. So how do you portray that? Okay, right? Two different camera angles. Okay. My typical response to a question like that is, I want to show how she feels. I don't, she doesn't feel like crying. She feels alone. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that camera and put it far back and give us a very wide shot and see her just by herself with no audio and a casket, yeah. right? That's how you can establish an emotion in a viewer. You can always take the camera and put it like right up in her face and you get her crying. Okay, cool. We see the action that's occurring. But if you want the audience to feel an emotion, you have to step into how that character feels in that particular story and try and understand how the audience can understand it and how they would be portraying it in their own brain. 
right? So that's why proper framing is important. You can actually elicit certain individual responses from individuals based on how stuff is framed. So uh, when Hamish was just in here right now, he wanted us to take a look at his website, which we did. And uh, inside of his website, if I can actually find it, I'll have to go find it again here really quickly because I had it set up, but it's not there right now. Um, on his website, he was talking specifically about how um, he was doing this film for 23andMe. Okay? And when you're doing a film uh, for 23andMe about DNA, okay, how do you try and get people to buy a product based on someone doing or, or giving the, this particular company their DNA? Right? That doesn't necessarily make sense. So his story that he came up with was that there's only one you. And you'll see the way that he established this particular shot and the way he established this particular story tells you, the viewer, a lot about what the product does and how it can benefit you. And pay particular attention to his framing and why he frames certain shots in a particular way. Let's just imagine I'm going to let each one of you pick out the car of your choice. And you say, well, what's the catch? Well, the catch is that it's the only car you're going to get in your entire lifetime. Now, what are you going to do knowing that's the only car you're ever going to have and you love that car? You're going to take care of it like you cannot believe. Now, what I'd like to suggest, you're not going to get only one car in your lifetime, but you are going to get only one body and only one mind. And that body and mind feels terrific right now, but it has to last you a lifetime. Thank you. Right? Basically, he's saying that you've got to treat your body like a car. You're only going to get one car. There's a story of like, hey, if you only get one car in your lifetime, how would you treat it, right? Because if it breaks down, it's done. You have no more transportation, right? In this, in this particular case, your body would be like the car. You only get one. If it breaks down, you're done. So how are we going to show someone in their life how there's only one of them, hence the title, only one you. How are we going to show that there is only one of you? And because there's only one of you, wouldn't you want to know everything about it? Let's try and transfer over. Let's start with a kid, someone who's very, very young, okay, on an empty road, okay? And as, as this story is being told and being progressed, I'm going to let each one. okay, we're gonna show this kid begin to grow up. Start with a toddler, everyone's looking down on him. Show how he gains friends and goes through life and some of the cool experiences that he employs and enjoys some of the triumphs that he's had, some of the failures, right? Triumph of, of being able to ride a bike, go to school, make more friends, meet a pretty girl, meet a bunch of friends, right? Show that transition kind of build up and then eventually see this guy actually transitions his life in such a way where the new life that he has helped create, this kid that's in the back seat, right? how that kid can know more about himself, right? And the way you can know more about himself is by buying into 23andMe, right? Learning more about your body. If you want to know, you can buy this particular product and it'll tell you more, right? Because the genes that you're passing down, you hope that continues to pass on and continues to grow, right? Framing the different types of shots, this shot in particular, the little boy looking, looking up, okay, before he's about to grow up, elicits an emotional response from you guys as the viewer, right? When you're looking down at a kid, it's, oh, he's so small, like he's cute, right? By the time he becomes an old dude, right, with a kid of his own, and he gets to see in the back seat, and it's very subtle too, right? Okay, you just see uh, him and a girl, and he's driving down the road, and the very subtle fact that he has a kid in the back seat, and it's a brand new kid, right? All you see is the feet. You don't get to see the face. Probably because they use the same baby, right, um, for, for both parts. But to know that this is what his life has led up to and how he can pass those memories on to other individuals and find out what he's passing on really hits home and elicits an emotional response, right? And most people wouldn't think about show, not showing the baby's face, 
right? You show the feet in the back seat. That tells you just enough to know that, hey, this guy has actually grown up and he has actually moved on and started creating kind of his own life and put his own stuff together, right? So that kind of stuff is, is really, really important. How do, you, how do you get to that? The only way you can get to that is if you're looking for emotional response. It's not just drawing out shots to draw out shots. It's what is it that you're trying to do with this specific story and why are you telling it in this particular way? Okay, so framing establishes the emotional scenes. Now we're gonna get into some terminology here really quick. And I'm gonna start going over different things that you guys are gonna need to know for editing purposes. Um, and so that way you guys can actually uh, um, uh, begin to utilize different what, transitions and different ways to edit. Uh, um, so that way you can elicit different responses because there were multiple different transitions inside that small little 60 second commercial. Okay, the first thing that we're gonna talk about is a cut. This is, the, this is what you will use most of the time and this is what we will focus on using at least for today and for your first project. You will not be allowed to use any dissolves or fades or transitions for your first video project. I wanna see how you can jump from one scene to the other to make a story flow, okay? A cut is a movement that goes from one shot or camera angle to another with no transition. So we have this shot and this shot and then this shot, okay? What's fantastic about a cut is you can use any sort of editing piece of software, any sort of editing software, in order to really create that transition, right? Because there is no transition. It just goes shot, 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 right? Okay, everybody. Um, yeah, right, there you go. That's what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? That, that's what you're supposed to be doing with, with your cuts, okay? Dissolves are a little bit different. Dissolves are, is actually a transition between two shots. So you go from one shot to the other, okay? If one shot simultaneously fades out, one shot, uh, the other shot simultaneously fades in, okay? A dissolve, though, is different than a fade, okay? Because if one shot is fading out, it has to be fading to nothing, right? If it's fading in, it has to start with nothing and then bring in the shot. So a fade is a transition from a, from a shot to black or from a shot to nothing where the image gradually becomes darker, okay? That's, that's a fade out. When, uh, if you do it the other way, if you have uh, the image be black and then it fades into where the image comes in fully and, bright, uh, and, uh, and becomes brighter, that's a fade in, okay? So a cut is shot to shot, dissolve is dissolving from one shot to the other, a fade is going from black or from nothing into another shot or from the shot into black or nothing, okay? So understanding just those basic differences will help you with a lot of different transitions because 95, 96, 97% of your shots are gonna be done with those three transitions. Now there is another one that I don't have listed up there and that's the wipe. Um, the wipe though is, is very, very generally used um, to show passage of time. Um, and so we're not, we're not gonna get into jumping in time because this is a basics course. We're not, we're not moving more to the advanced stuff. If you start really kind of getting involved in this a little bit more, then you can start using wipes. Then you can start using what are called masks, mask wipes and so on and so forth where you actually trace around a particular individual and you have that person walk through and it cuts from one shot to the next. You can get really razzly dazzly with, with a lot of your editing tricks. But this is basically where it starts, okay? So we have a cut, we have a dissolve, and a fade. By the way, this is the exact same thing when it comes to music. Okay, for those of you that have had Ruiz's class, he probably went over this on how to transition. You either cut from one beat to the next, you can dissolve between the two by dragging volume handles up and down, or you can transition that way between the two by using a dissolve, or you can fade the music out or fade the music in, right? That, those terminologies or those terms are, are interchangeable between audio and video. Okay. So that's the very basics. Now let's start jumping into uh, what different camera angles elicit. Up until now, you guys have mostly focused on a level camera angle, okay? Now that we kind of really, uh, we understand what our, our seven basic shots are, we can start moving the camera up and down on the Y axis as opposed to just the X axis, right? Where you set up a shot and you have a straight flat on, flat on image, okay? A high camera angle is what we saw in that opening shot of Hamish's video for 23andMe with the little boy. The little boy is down, the camera is up high. That high camera angle is a camera angle which looks down on its subject, making the subject look small, weak, and unimportant, okay? When you take a look at a child or at a baby like we were taking a look at there, you'll notice that that kid looks like he's unimportant. He's just staring, 
right? He's very, very weak. Anyone can come and pick up that baby and take it and go do whatever they want with it, right? If they really, really wanted to. Our society would look very, uh, will look down harshly on them, but technically they could do it. Why? Because it's easy for snatching, right? Which, by the way, there are some species of animals. Man, they're crazy uh, with how they go after, after others' offspring, okay? But anyways, that's what the high camera angle does, okay? It looks down, makes it look small, weak, or unimportant, okay? There are a couple of times where if you take a look at a drone shot, right? When a drone is up high up in the air, it makes what's below it seem small and weak. It makes it look interesting because we want to see that as being important. But from the drone's perspective, it's not really that important, right? The individuals that are occurring in that shot, eh, who cares about those individuals, right? We care more about what we can see and set with the setting, right? So we're, so we're not necessarily uh, concentrating on the subject with our, with our drone shots. We're concentrating on the setting that surrounds those particular um, characters, so those particular subjects with our drone shots, okay? A level camera angle, though, is a little bit different. This is what we've been working on for a while. Uh, level camera angle is even with the subject, okay? Straight out, the, out about the eye line, right? Most of these uh, lessons that I've been giving to you guys, when you, if you go back and take a look at them for the lectures and stuff, the camera angle seems like it's about level. Okay? We want it to appear that way because I'm talking to two individuals and with individuals, not down at individuals or up to individuals. So understanding the positioning of the camera becomes important when you're trying to elicit an emotional response from a, from a viewer. Okay? And then last but not least, we have the low camera angle. The low camera angle is a camera angle that looks, uh, that looks up at its subjects and it makes the subjects look powerful and seem very, very important. So in that football video that I showed very, very early on, we have a lot of level camera angles because we want to show that these guys are intense on their level. But there's also a couple of shots where the girls drop down the shot just a little bit. So you have this slight looking down where it seems like these guys are a little bit more giant, a little bit more powerful. Okay, because we want to see giants coming out into a stadium to, uh, to engage in battle, right? That's what we're hoping to see tonight uh, if you're going to the football game. You want to see gladiators or warriors come together, smash each other, trying to get a ball further down the field, and, and hopefully by the end of the battle and the skirmish, we come out victorious. Go for it, Jacob. So, yep. Uh-huh. So how do you apply distance to shots? So, good question. So that goes back to where we were talking about framing and how if you have something that's far away, you feel, you feel distant from that particular um, um, individual or from that particular subject. So uh, when we were going over framing, I talked about how extreme wide shots, you can barely even see the little subject because he's so small. Whereas an extreme close-up, you're so in the face that you just can't help but have, an in, but have to make your mind up about how you feel about that individual. When, when you're choosing your particular shots, your wide shots, your mids, or your close-ups, that's where you're establishing emotional reaction, if that makes sense. So in my, in my demonstration of the widow being far away uh, from an individual, it, it allows the audience to feel and see that she is alone in the space because I'm showing off the setting and I'm showing the character in the space and showing how no one can help her, even the audience. Because even if the audience wanted to reach out, they can't reach and get there. So that wouldn't have anything to do with the angles because we're talking about math now. So math means that if we're angling it, we want to change different things. This is, uh, this is different space. This is just, yeah, this is purely distance and stuff. Good question though. <laughs> right? By the way, people are wondering, why do you do math in your classes? This is why. Because the, be the better you understand angles, the better you understand distance and time over distance and so on and so forth, the better you can actually understand emotions, the better you can understand relationships, the better you can understand communication. Okay, I know it's crazy that that's a mathematical concept, but it's a mathematical concept. Okay, um, so anyways, uh, so those are the those are the different camera angles, right? <clears throat> There's a, two different types of shots that that are a little bit different that don't have to deal with the distance. I guess you can say that you are from a subject. Um, it's it's what you're trying to elicit emotionally from a from your audience as a result of uh, how the shot is being portrayed. Okay, so first thing we have is a POV or a point of view shot. A POV is a shot uh, which is understood as being from the perspective of the character within the scene. Okay, this is why video games, most people will like first person games when it comes to video games. 
because if you're first person, you are now experiencing that as a character within the game. If you are third person, you're walking behind an individual or a character that is experiencing what you're experiencing in the game. So you get to safely be behind them as that character encounters obstacles versus being involved with those particular obstacles. Okay, for the longest time, I used the example of GTA 5. GTA 5, when it first came out, was uh, third person only. You had to go around and experience the story as the characters. You didn't get to experience it as yourself in the position of the characters. Those are two completely different feelings, right? <clears throat> if I was sitting behind you in class, it's much different than sitting in your chair, right? So, so understanding the, the perspective and the point of view is important because if you're shooting a particular shot from the character, from the perspective of the character, it means you're telling the audience that you want them to feel as if they are experiencing this. If you shoot it from behind an individual, which a lot of people, you'll see it in here, like those freaking walking, walking shots where you're walking behind someone, right? You wanna show what that person is experiencing as they're experiencing it, but you don't want the audience, uh, audience to actually experience it as that individual, right? So when you're developing video games, you wanna have a very, very clear idea and understanding uh, of how you want the player to experience the world. For GTA 5, they specifically chose third person, so that way it didn't feel as if you were murdering individuals on the street when you were driving a car. Your character was, right? When GTA allowed you all of a sudden to have the first person perspective, and all of a sudden you were running down those individuals and hitting them with your cars, that's a completely different feeling, especially in GTA Online. Which, by the way, do they have first person on GTA Online anymore? Yes. They do? Okay, yeah, so they did add that in. Um, it's interesting, right? Because you are your own character online. I think that's when they introduced it. I don't think they introduced it for the story. I think they introduced it in online, right? Because it's crazy because if you experience, so there, it's much different where you watch your character uh, pick up a prostitute versus being the character dealing with the prostitute, right? Inside of GTA 5, totally different experience. And this is why, by the way, some lawmakers say that video games are making our youth violent. It's not because video games make our youth violent, make you guys violent and stuff. It puts you inside of the perspective of what an individual would do in that specific instance. And so you run a simulation and get practice, and if you know certain things don't work, that's why you start to do other things. This is why, by the way, most individuals your age started targeting places where there weren't any weapons or guns or police officers because you got trained through video games in a lot of ways subconsciously to look for spaces that don't have police and before, so that way you can last longer get more stars and so on and so forth, okay? So you start to see that more. So then people, so then in 1999, when you had Columbine happen, there's no school resource officer. There, were, there weren't officers really at, at schools up until that point. There wasn't a need for them. It wasn't until after playing Doom over and over and over again, and then playing Counter-Strike over and over and over again, that students, or that students, guys your age, people that are still growing and developing their mental capacities and make mental capabilities, began to think as if they were those characters, but in real life. Right? And so it's, it's different when you kind of understand that, that type of stuff. Okay? Um, there's two different types of reaction shots. Um, the first one is you get a reaction of a character looking at someone that, or something that's off screen. Okay? So it's a response, it's an emotional response to something that is happening that we can't see. So you'll see like on BNN sometimes they would zoom in when they went around and did the let's talk, they would zoom in on people's faces. That's a reaction shot because we're getting the reaction of the person to a particular thing. The second type of reaction shot is where a, sh a shot is someone is in the conversation where they're not giving a, a line of dialogue, but they're just listening along. Because we want to see their reaction to what's being said or what's being done on screen as that particular shot occurs. So we're not going to jump in and just see the reaction. We're going to see the reaction alongside of the individual that's speaking or discussing things. Okay. <clears throat> now, when it comes to camera movement, again, Okay, when certain things are moving up and down and so on and so forth, we have to start to utilize and begin to understand those terms. Because if someone says tilt and someone moves left and right, that person didn't understand the meaning of the word tilt. So that's the reason why I kind of want to define these and kind of get this out a little bit, a little bit more. Um, here are some basic uh, um, camera, camera terms. Uh, we have a pan. A pan is a steady sweeping movement of the camera from left to right or right to left. It's along the X axis. Okay, so there's a fixed pivot point wherever that camera is. If you turn it from left to right, it's the x-axis. 
or from right to left, x-axis. Okay, that's a pan. So if someone says pan, okay, that's what they're talking about. They're moving along that axis. A tilt is the same thing where you're at a fixed position, except instead of moving left to right, you move up or down. Okay, that's along the y-axis on the pivot point. Tracking is a little bit different. Tracking is a movement in which the camera, to, the camera moves alongside or moves along with that particular object or subject. Right? So instead of panning from right to left from the camera at a fixed point in position, tracking is we're going to move the camera along with the subject. Uh, left to right or right to left. Might even move up or down. Okay? Might even move in or out. That's along the z-axis. Okay? But all of that is tracking. And the reason why they would call it tracking was because you lay down tracks so that way the camera can move on something and it would look like railroad tracks. Okay? So that's where tracking kind of comes in. Okay? Zooms are where you have the camera again at your fixed point, your fixed position, and instead of moving the camera, you, move, you actually physically move the lens capability. And when you move the lens capability, it makes you feel as if you're moving closer or further away from the subject. Okay, so if someone says zoom in, but what they really mean is they want the person to track forward, those terms can be, get mixed up a, a lot and become problems and issues. Okay, if you want someone to stay in their fixed position and then move their lens forward or backwards to so that way they can zoom in on something, that's when you can kind of utilize that. Right, so for the football game tonight, we're going to have, uh, I think, five or six cameras that are at fixed positions. So they only have pan, tilt, and zoom. They don't have a chance to track. We will have one wireless camera that can track if we want it to, because that thing has the ability to move in and out, and as well as pan, tilt, and zoom. Right? So you get a lot more options when you add in the tracking capabilities, but you don't necessarily need to follow those, those particular uh, capabilities. Now, here's something that's interesting about all of these. In order for you to start doing special or visual effects inside of After Effects, you have to understand these terms. Because when you're moving stuff inside of After Effects, you are moving a digital camera in a digital space, or a virtual camera in a virtual world. Okay, So if you're going to be moving that camera, you need to understand these specific capabilities. Because sometimes you might need to move the camera along the x-axis. Sometimes you need to move the camera along the y-axis, and so on and so forth. Okay, So understanding these particular terms will allow you to better move or utilize the camera digitally or virtually, as well as in the real world. Okay, we haven't even gotten to the operation of cameras. We still need to understand how these instruments can move and what they can do, but this gives you a baseline to start with. Okay, when we jump into Final Cut Pro today and I start kind of going over some of that stuff, you'll see that um, as we start uh, kind of jumping in and, and utilizing some stuff today. Okay. Make sure we see where we're at. Okay. Cool. So those are the terms that we need to know before we start moving now into uh, moving into actually editing. Now, I posed a question earlier today when we first started out, which is, what is editing? Okay. And I'm going to follow that up by, by kind of responding to it in, in this way. Editing is refinement, like you guys were saying, but it's not just refinement to tell the original story that you had. It's refinement to push your story forward. Okay. When we write our story outline, Okay, we're coming up with our ideas that we had, or we're writing down or solidifying our ideas that we had during our brainstorm. When we write our story treatment, we're, cut, we're solidifying what we wrote down in our story outline, but also adding in new or different things that we're developing as we're kind of talking about and discussing that particular story. When we write our script, we take stuff from our story outline and we space it out into different segments so that we can break it down and expand it in certain areas or shorten it in other places. Okay, so all of these options, all these items that we're doing, we're taking our story and we're not just refining it, but we're, we're fixing it to try and make it better and push it further forward, right? Editing does the same. Most people think it's just, hey, someone gives you footage, you splice stuff together and you have a story. And that's, I guess, a form of editing that's like chopping stuff up and throwing it together. It's like, it's like creating food, right? And everyone can give you the ingredients and you can just kind of make your own instant coffee. I'm trying to teach you guys how to actually create the coffee bean tree where you grow your own beans and then you ground them down you create really good looking coffee, right? Um, that's kind of what, what this version of editing does. Editing is the arranging and rearranging of scenes or separate components such as scenes and dialogue to tell, us to tell a story in a very particular way. 
Okay. Its purpose is to structure a video based on a pre-approved outline, script, and storyboard. Um, but it is most often considered the second part of storytelling, okay, or the retelling of your story. It's a chance for you to go back and fix what wasn't there originally. So when you're writing your or you're editing your story, or editing your essay, I should say, when you're editing your essay, what you're doing is going back and retelling that story in a way that actually makes sense, right? If you were just writing your essay once and then turning it in just to satisfy a particular um, goal that your teacher has set out, chances of it being very good are like slim to none, right? You kind of want to write it and then go back over it and make sure it looks actually make sure make sure it looks good. Now, the really good people in life can actually write a little bit, and go back and edit, write a little bit, go back and edit, write a little bit, go back and edit, and they can do these things all along. That's very, very difficult for most people's brains to do though because you have to alternate back and forth between your left hemisphere and right hemisphere. Because left is for creation, right is for structuring. Left is for creation, right is for structuring. Okay? So in order to operate back and forth between left and right, you have to have very, very good connections in your brain to do that. Most of the time, you want to write, 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 get all your creation out, and then switch over and then go back and edit, go back and edit, go back and edit, go back and edit. Which by the way, this is why some of you guys, when you guys were doing your, um, uh, brainstorming stuff, we're able to contribute ideas, but weren't able to write them down on paper. You're stuck on the left side of your brain and couldn't transition over to the right side of your brain where you had to structure things and write stuff down. Okay, there's a lot of that that goes on in this class where you jump back and forth, left and right, to make sure your brain is structured. That's what editing allows you to do. Editing is the restructuring of things. So when it comes to editing inside of Final Cut Pro, how do we know um, what to utilize and use? How can we speed things up? One of the questions that I always get from students is, is, can I have more time to work on this video? The answer more than likely will be no, not just because no, but because, hey, we just don't have the time, right? The video that you guys saw that uh, up here on the screen that I played is actually different than the Instagram version of the video that we put out that has over 5,000 views. We had to meet a specific deadline in order to make sure that people saw it at just the right time, so that way we kept hype at a particular level during this particular day. So if we missed that deadline and didn't get out all of our stuff, it doesn't matter because we, we, we missed our timing window. Okay? Um, but one of the reasons why we missed that timing window was because the computer kept on giving us issues. So instead of having to be able to use just the mouse and a click, we had to use, or sorry, just to be able to use the keyboard, we had to use a mouse and a click. That cost us a few milliseconds. Well, if you add enough, a few thousand milliseconds, you're now costing yourself seconds. If you add enough seconds, you're costing yourself minutes. If you're adding up enough minutes, you're costing yourself hours. So trying to be able to move faster as we're editing becomes really, really important. That's what these keyboard shortcuts are going to allow you to do. Okay? So if you want to open something typically inside of Final Cut Pro, you'd hit Command O. Open is different than importing stuff, and we'll get to importing here in a little bit. Okay? If you want to open a selected item, you'd hit Return on the keyboard rather than going over and double clicking on it. If you just hit return, it'll automatically open up. Okay? In order to quit out of an application on a Mac uh, computer, it's not going up and closing the window. I've seen a lot of people do that where they go up and they close the window. All that does is close the window. If you want to quit the application, you have to hold down the, the command key, which is right next to the space, board, uh, space bar. Space board? Oof. Right next to the space bar, hold down the command key and hit the letter Q. And when you do that, it'll quit out of the application that you're in. It'll close everything down for you and so on and so forth. Okay? If you want to undo something, because inevitably you will want to undo things, that's Command Z. If you want to redo something that you accidentally undid too much, that's where you hold down Shift and hit Command Z, and it'll redo that thing that you actually wanted to do. All of these options are much faster than you've taken a mouse, moving it to the point on a particular screen, clicking on a window, going down to the option, going into the other option, and then clicking on that option. Right? So keyboard shortcuts are your friends. They will actually help you out quite a bit. It's how we're able to edit and put together the show for BNN as quickly as we do because we're hitting just keys that do specific functions. And we map out what those functions are as we're putting stuff together. This, these are functions that Final Cut Pro has. Now if you take a look at the mouse that you have on, on these computers, you'll see it does not have a right click button. Some of you noticed that when you first started utilizing it. Right? It's a single click mouse button. If you want to right click on something, you have to hold down control with your left hand and then click. Okay? This is ergonomically better and more correct because if you have left hand and you're using this hand, in theory you're not using carpal tunnel going back and forth between your 
index finger and your middle finger. Instead, you're still utilizing your, middle your index finger, but you're just using it for both hands. Right, that's the reason why Apple has it that way. So some of you were trying to right click on stuff and couldn't right click on stuff, you had to hold down control in order to be able to do that. Okay. Inside of Final Cut, you guys are gonna have to choose your videos. When you start choosing your videos, you will want to cut out stuff that you don't want before and cut out stuff you don't want after a particular shot. When you hit the record button, I have this recorded so that way you guys, I know I told you this. When you hit the record button first, hit it, then count down three, two, one. Don't say three, two, one, and then hit record because all that time previously that you might want to use for a transition isn't there, right? So you want to make sure that it's there for you to transition into rather than you just starting your record at a particular spot. You can always go back in and edit those parts out by setting your new endpoint or setting an out point on a clip. Okay, so that's what these buttons are for. I and O are for you to set endpoints on a clip and then an out point. If you, only, if you have a five second long clip yet you only want to use three seconds of it, you can set your endpoint by hitting the letter I at one second into your video and you can set your out point by hitting the letter O at four seconds into your video. And now you just have a clip that's three seconds long. Okay, if you want to get rid of those, those points or move them around, you can hit option I, it'll remove it and allow you to reset it. Okay, so these keyboard shortcuts are really going to come in handy because some of you guys might have 120 different clips. Well, if you have 100 diff 120 different clips, you're going to have close to 120 shots. If you have 120 shots, that's a lot of storyboard, number one. But num number two, you're not going to be able to add those all in one right after the other. Right? You're going to trim out certain portions of it. And that's what these, what these inpoints and outpoints allow you to do. If you want to get rid of all of them that are on there, if you hit option X, they're like scissors. That's the reason why the X is the way it is. Okay, it gets rid of all the endpoints or outpoints and allows you to reset them. Okay. Endpoints and outpoints. Okay, I, O, option I, option O, option X. Okay. Next thing, copying and pasting. Some of you guys had a hard time doing this inside of Google Docs or inside of OneDrive when you guys are writing your scripts and your stories. Okay. Here's the reason why. On, a, on an Apple computer, it's not control C in order for you to copy things. Apple's operating system is a little bit different. They wanted to be closer to the keyboard so your hands didn't have to stretch so far, right? Plus the control key is used for, used for right clicking. So if you have certain commands that you want to perform, you have to hold down the command key and then hit the letter. So if you want to copy, it's command C. To cut is command X. To paste is command V. To select all is command A. But then sometimes inside of Final Cut Pro, we have some elements where you might want to take or copy certain items from a clip and paste it onto another clip. You'd want to hold down Shift, hit Command and V, and that would copy, or sorry, that would paste all those particular elements. Okay, that's the reason why it's called space, Paste Special. And you'll be utilizing this function quite a bit. Okay, um, you, will, you will see that if you typically have an editing question, and I know it's something that I went over in the lecture, I'm going to ask you to go back to your notes and take a look at it first because I know it's there. I, I know we went over it. Um, these com keyboard commands, if you're planning on being with me for the next couple of years, you'll need to memorize these, not right now, but at some point as you continue using them throughout the year, because we constantly use them over and over and over again. I wouldn't put them up on here if we didn't use them. There are technically over 250 individual commands inside of Final Cut Pro. I used to have my intro classes memorize them all. Now I don't do that. Okay, now I just give you guys the essentials and if you have other questions on how to do things, you have to go back and kind of look it up. Okay. So again, your copy paste, command C, command X, command V, command A, and then to paste something special is shift command V. Okay, now how do you navigate inside of Final Cut Pro? YouTube borrowed a lot of its functionality from Final Cut. Okay, so if you're used to using YouTube to move forward or backward frames and stuff like that, you kind of have an idea of how Final Cut Pro is going to work. Now, YouTube's kind of gone off and done their own thing now, where it inst instead of it used to being one frame or an individual frame, it's like skip forward by five seconds or backwards by five seconds. But originally, when you hit the left and right arrows, it was move forward one frame or move back one frame. So if some of you want to get really close in there and try and cut at a very, very specific point when someone does something, you can do so by using the left and right arrow keys on your keyboard. Okay, you have to be clicked on that clip, and then you can use the left and right arrow keys, and then it'll make sense. 
Okay. If you want to go back to the beginning of a clip, you can hit the home key, which by the way is located just above the arrow keys on your keyboard. Okay, for people wondering where that is. Or you can hit the end key to go to the end of that particular clip. And then anytime you want something to start, you can hit the space bar to start or to stop it. Okay. <clears throat> so this will allow you to navigate through your videos faster as you're putting them together. Okay. And then I have one more slide, and then we'll actually start, start hopping into this stuff here in a second. Okay. Last slide. And then we'll move into the demonstration portion of our thing today. Other keys that you'll be using quite a bit. Anytime you insert an SD card into the back of the computer, you're going to need to import the footage. Okay. You won't be dragging stuff and dropping it on your desktop. Final Cut doesn't work that way. Final Cut takes your files and drops them into their library, so that way it's self-contained inside of a particular folder. Leaving stuff on your desktop is a great way to start losing videos. Right? So you're going to import them through the application or through the software. So if you want to import anything, whether it's audio, video, or pictures, you'll hit Command-I to import. Okay, and then if you want to delete anything, you hit the big, uh, the big delete button. Okay. <coughs> okay, so all these keyboard shortcuts will be used even today, okay, as you guys are going through stuff. This isn't stuff that I just throw up on a screen like I said and, oh, okay, you don't, you don't have to worry about later on. Literally, I'll probably be going through and utilizing them all today as we're learning how to utilize, uh, utilize uh, our, our software. Okay. If you guys are not logged into the computers, go ahead and log into your computers right now because I want to start utilizing some of this functionality and start kind of going over with you what the application is like. <coughs> All right. So when you log in for the very first time, okay, you will see, oops, I don't want that. Project. Yeah, it should give me that. Uh, when you log in for the very first time, you open up Final Cut Pro, you're going to see some stuff that's a little bit different than what you'll be seeing up here on my screen. Okay? Because it is the first time you're utilizing this particular software, some, some changes have to occur. Okay? So once you log in, once you log in, you'll see it down inside of your dock. Okay? My dock is a little bit different than your dock, so let me go ahead and pull that up so that way you guys can see it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and exit out of this, right? My dock is right here down at the bottom. You'll see I have a bunch of different options available to me, okay? If you want to open up Final Cut Pro, it is this one right here that is shaped like a take reel, okay? Normally, this is what you would use to synchronize audio and video together. If you hover over any of the items that are down here in the dock, it'll tell you what application or piece of software that item is. So you can hover over uh, Final Cut Pro and click on it and go ahead and start opening Final Cut Pro up. Okay, if you have not already done so. Okay, now when you do, you will see a screen that pops up talking to you about all the new features that are available to you inside of Final Cut Pro. All you have to do is just go ahead and click uh, on that and just click OK. Um, if it asks for you, to, if, if you have permission to access your photos, the microphone, and so on and so forth, go ahead and hit OK on all of those because you guys will need to have access to that particular information in order for you to really begin to understand how to best utilize Final Cut Pro. Okay. <clears throat> okay. If you are uh, experiencing an error in which it says someone is using the application still or someone else under your login is using that application, please let me know. This is why, by the way, we use Command Q to quit out of the application. It blocks it from everyone else from being able to use it. Is anyone experiencing the error in which it states that you cannot log in? So Marissa, okay, give me. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll go ahead and take care of that for you really quick. Stand by really quick while we work to try and be sure that everyone has their computers up and going. What's great about this, um, this particular piece of software um, is that it is very, very robust in the way that you can set it up, um, but it is also very, very unstable. 
Video production is one of the most resource intensive things that you can do on any sort of computer. Okay. Let's see here. Marissa, you should be good to go. It's there. Good. Anyone else having any issues? Cool. Everyone's screen should look like mine. You got yours, Rajan? On the dock. Okay, so this computer is a problem, so let's go to Finder. Click on Applications on the left-hand side. Last but not least, if you can't find uh, Final Cut Pro or if it is not appearing in your dock, okay, cool. If it is not appearing in your dock, what you can do is you can always, let me pull this back up here on screen, you can always go right down here to Finder in the bottom left-hand corner. It'll open up a Finder window for you where it'll have like a bunch of information and stuff like that for you. It just has my downloads folder open right now. If you go to the applications option on the left hand side, you'll be able to scroll down and scroll through and find any application that you need in alphabetical order. Okay, you will see Final Cut Pro listed in there and you can double click on it. So that way you can pull up Final Cut Pro if you need to pull up Final Cut Pro. Okay, or if there's something else in the dock that you need to pull up as well. All right, did that work? Yeah, okay, um, so just so you guys know, it'll feel like the computer is slow. It is actually not slow, just so you know. It is loading all the information. Like I said, video production is one of the most resource intensive things that you can do on a machine or on a computer today. Um, and so it, it'll, it'll come across a little bit slower than you might think, but that doesn't actually mean that it's actually slow. Okay, um, it's just, it actually takes that long to load. There's actually a meme that goes around specifically talking about uh, Premiere and how uh, Premiere, when it opens, it crashes. Because it stuff like that can constantly open and crash. It's just one of those things that happens and that, that, that you do. OK, cool. So it looks like everyone is, is, uh, has the same screen I do. Um, the first thing I want to do is take us around what it is you guys are seeing. Okay, On the left-hand side of your screen over here, this is what's called the, uh, the library window. Okay. This left-hand side of the screen with this sidebar shows you all the different libraries that you can have open. Now up here, as we get closer to the wind, uh, up here in this upper uh, left-hand corner window, you'll see there's an icon that has four stars on it. Okay, That is the title of your library. The four stars mean that there is a bundle of things that are put together inside of that particular library. Now inside of a library, you can have multiple events. Okay, it's just like our story outline. If it has, if the option or the item has one star next to it, like you can see up here in this upper left hand corner, this one does, that means it is one component of a larger library. You can have multiple libraries that you can open up and transfer between machines. In our particular case though, we are only going to use one library. Okay, because you don't need to be constantly creating new libraries. You can create new events inside that library. We're utilizing six or seven, uh, sorry, seven um, events this year, seven different projects that we can do, and you can list them inside of, <coughs> inside of here. Okay, your first event will always start out with the date that it was created on. Okay, so right now it should say 9-2019. Above that, you will see an option that says Smart Collections. It's a folder. If you click the down arrow left to the left of Smart Collections, it'll show all of your items inside of this particular library that are either all video, all audio, stuff that you've favorited, stuff that's only projects, or stuff that's only stills. So if you're looking for particular videos inside of this library, you can click on your Smart Collections and click on All Video, and it'll show you all the video that's in there, okay, if you need to see all your stuff in there. Okay, so that's very, very useful for this stuff, okay. For your library, it's currently titled Untitled. If you want to change it, remember we talked about in our, uh, in our, um, in our uh, lesson uh, when I was going over uh, terms. If you just want to open an item, you can hit return on it. So if you click on that particular item and hit return, you'll see it allows you to change the name of your library. So you can change the name of your library to whatever it is that you want to. I'm going to call mine Sipes Library, if I can spell my own name correctly. Okay. And then you click out. Okay. That's going to change the name of that particular library. Now, you might move from computer to computer and might want to take your library with you, which has all your videos in it. You can do so by just knowing where that library is saved. If you ever want to know where this library is saved, you hover over it and let your uh, mouse just sit there for a second. It'll give you the full pathway 
for where this particular item is stored. So in my case, it's stored under users, under JSIPE, under movies, and it's called SIPE's library. So if I ever needed to go find it, I can just look for the movies folder, and I'll be able to find where it says SIPE's library okay, inside the movies folder. Okay. The next thing underneath this like I, that I was talking about were specific events. So your first event that you're going to be creating in here is, is something for your egg story. We are going to take either your storyboards if you did them, or we are going to create new storyboards inside of Final Cut Pro to edit this particular egg story together so we can see what this thing would look like as it's played out over three to five minutes. Okay, so this is where we're actually going to start playing with this editing software a little bit. So if we go over here and we hit return on this particular uh, thing, we can change it. So I'm going to title this egg story and then click out. And you'll see that when I do, I have a new event that's titled egg story inside of my library. Okay. First thing you always want to do is make sure you have a library figured out. Next thing you want to do is make sure that your events are, are good to go inside of it. Okay. Now, once you're inside of a, a, an event, you can have projects, you're going to have media, you're going to have a ton of other stuff. Right now, if you were to take a look at your guys' window, you have no project and you have no media. So you have one option that says right here in the middle, import media. This is in the media, media window that we're taking a look at. And down here at the bottom, it'll say new project because we haven't created a project yet down here in our timeline window. Okay. So what we're going to do next is we're going to go down here to the bottom inside your timeline. You're going to click on new project. And you'll see when you click on new project, you will have an option to create a new project. Now, when that option appears, you guys will not see what I see. Let me uh, go back to the automatic settings. Okay? This is what you will see when you create a new project. Every time you create a project, it will ask you what settings do you want your final video to be used in. Okay? If you have it set to automatic and to set the video based on the first video clip properties, if you were to drop a, an SD video, a standard definition video, down into the timeline, it's going to change that to a standard definition format. If you want it to start out in a high definition format in a very particular way, you have to use more custom settings or you have to drop down the size or the format of the clip that you want to use into your project so that way it, it adjusts it accordingly. Now for you guys, when you're working on your project, you will typically just want to use the automatic settings where it sets the properties based on your first video clip because in theory, you're only using one camera. Okay? If you're using multiple cameras, you want the highest quality um, image, the highest quality video to be the first one that you import or that you drag and drop down into your timeline so that way it sets the properties based on that. So we're going to use the auto automatic settings for now. But if you wanted to use custom settings, you can click on custom settings and you'll see you'll get options how to set up your particular settings accordingly. If you want to edit a 4K video, cool, great, you can edit in 4K. Your video won't be 4K, it'll be really, really small and really grainy, but you can technically do that. Okay? Most of our stuff that we output to will be outputted at 1080. We will not be scaling up or doing anything in 4K. We won't be scaling down to 720 either for the most part. It'll be 1080 that we'll basically leave our stuff at. Okay? So that's your format. Then you get to choose your resolution. Okay? Each of these resolutions, the more pixels there are, the, more, the higher the number will go. Okay? 1920 by 1080 is standard, so we're going to leave it at 1920 by 1080 because that's standard. And then you get to choose your frame rate. Okay? Different frame rates do different things and have your video appear different ways. If you shoot a video at 30p or 30 frames per second at progressive scan rate, that's what the P stands for, it means progressive, it means a whole frame, not, not half of a frame is being put up on screen. Okay? If you have a 30 frame per second video that you're trying to edit in 60 frame per second, it's going to skip because the project thinks they're supposed to be 60 frames, but what, in order, what it does in order to make sure there are 60 frames is it doubles up every frame inside of the 30 frame video. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. So if you're editing inside of a 60 frame per second project and your video is only 30, 30 frames per second, there are not enough frames in order to fit inside that 60 second time period. So it doubles each frame. And that's the reason why you'll get a little bit of skipping. Okay, so you'll see that sometimes on BNN where there's some skipping and stuff. It's because some people film stuff in 30 when we export out to 60 and so on and so forth. OK, 
okay? Typically, we'll edit at 2997. That's the broadcast standard. Okay, so that way if we lose, lose one frame here or there, we don't really lose too much, okay? The big thing, though, that we're going to be doing is up here at the top where it says project name is making sure that our project is named accordingly, okay? So I'm going to call uh, mine, I'm going to call mine just storyboard edit because this is my storyboard edit that I'm going to put together. You guys can call your project whatever you want, and you can always rename it later on if you want to. Okay? Some people just call it egg story inside of egg story because they only do one, one edit, one version of their, their video. If you want to make multiple versions of your video, though, you can make different edits of it. Okay? Uh, say that again. Why would anyone do that? Oh, okay, never mind. You guys are getting that. By the way, the reason why someone would make multiple edits is because sometimes they want to show shots and see how it looks, and other times they want to have a finalized version of different things. Okay, so I'm going to call my storyboard edit, and I'm going to hit OK. And you'll see that when I hit OK, I now have, let me move this to trash, okay, I now have a project inside of my viewer or media window in the upper left-hand corner, and I now have a timeline down here at the bottom uh, the bottom window of my, of, my, uh, of my project, okay? So we have libraries, which contain events, and events which contain projects and media. That's the hierarchy for how things go. So if I ask you, where's your project? Your project is inside of the media window. If I ask you where your library is, it is the thing that holds your event and your project. Okay, it's the big, big other thing. You can point out this area over here. Okay, so there, there are multiple things that you have access to and that you can kind of create um, just based on that particular information. Now, just because I have items here and I have the ability to edit and drop things down here doesn't mean I actually have files. Okay, this is where you would normally begin to import footage. We went over the shortcut for importing just a couple seconds ago. What is the keyboard shortcut in order to import something into Final Cut Pro? Anyone? Can I just give it to you in your notes? Anyone take notes on that? Command I, okay? So if you hold down Command and hit the letter I, you will see now that all of a sudden you will have the ability to pull up information or pull out files into Final Cut Pro. Okay, this gives you the option or the ability to go and discover and find different options or different items on the computer that's set in front of you. Okay, so let me go over this import window. The first thing I want you to see is over here on the left hand side. You'll see you'll have three options, cameras, devices, and favorites. Okay, under cameras, you guys will have one option. That is the camera that is already at your, on your computer. That's your FaceTime camera. Go ahead and click on that. Okay, I don't have that option because I do not have FaceTime on my computer because of the monitor that I'm using. It will ask you for permission to open up that particular monitor and that particular camera. You can go ahead and click OK. Very rarely will you use this, but this is something that you do have available to you. That is a camera that you have uh, in there in order to be able to utilize or pick up stuff from a camera on your computer. Next, underneath that, you have devices. So now click on Macintosh HD. Just click it once. Okay. When you click on Macintosh HD, you'll see that it takes away your camera. Okay. It's not pictured up there right now. The reason why it's not pictured up there right now is because you don't have an SD card put into the back of your computer. Make sure you guys aren't getting distracted by watching yourselves up on screen. <laughs> okay. Catch up with us. Right. Remember, we're recording lessons here for other people too, right? So um, uh, what you don't see right now is your SD card up there under cameras. If your SD card was there, you'd be able to import footage from that SD card. Okay, so if you go and film something outside, you'll be able to bring it back. It'll drop under cameras. Devices are your computers or network uh, capabilities if you need to attach something from the network. Most of you guys won't need to do that, but if you need to find stuff, it's there. Last but not least are your favorites. So you have your desktop, which you'll be using quite a bit. So if you never know where files are, put them on your desktop because you can see them and import them into Final Cut this way. And you'll also have your home folder. Now click on your home folder, okay? When you click on your home folder, you will see a bunch of different options available to you down here at the bottom of the screen, okay? Most likely, you're downloading stuff into your downloads folder. If you double click on downloads, 
you will see all the different videos or the options for things that you've downloaded available to you, including, in theory, your PDFs. If you single click on your PDF that's inside of your group's folder, if you're a producer, you should see a image <coughs> of that particular document. Now, in my case, <coughs> excuse me. Now, in my case, I have a bunch of videos that I've downloaded. So I have a bunch of different stuff that I can pull through and, and pull up and import in here. However, there is the option and the capability for you guys to import either audio or a video that you've downloaded into these particular, uh, into these particular things. <clears throat> so now that you have this option, you can see where you can begin to import different items and things as you're importing it. Last thing I want to go over for the import screen is what's over here on the right hand side. There are a lot of different options available for you on the right side of this window. For the most part, you guys will add it to your existing event, so make sure add to existing event is checked. If you need to change your event, you can change it from the drop down window and you can import it into other places. Okay? You want to make sure the file is being copied to the library and not being left in place. And then you can go down to where it says import selected. Now, some people were asking me, what happens if I have multiple files I need to import? Because right now, this only imports the one thing that I have selected. If you hold down the command option and click on these other items, you'll see that you can import multiple different items. This is important when you guys want to import only very specific videos from your camera. You don't just want to come in and import all your clips, because if you import all your clips, well, now you have a bunch in there that you don't want to use, and now it clutters up your project timeline, and you start to have other issues, and so on and so forth. Okay? So that's not necessarily a good way to go about it. You really, really want to be able to import multiple clips by clicking and holding down Command, so that way you can take a look at this stuff. Okay? Right now, these are listed out as a list view. If you would like to change the view, you can go down here to the bottom right hand corner. Sorry, that's not the right one. Where is it? There is a way to change it from uh, just a list view to actually looking at the actual image. And apparently I don't see it up here because they moved it around. So it's not listed on this particular page. It used to be where you could choose the option or change it from list view, but it doesn't look like it's there anymore. Uh, it's an option. You'll see it. It looks like an image. So you'll be able to see the images of your videos as opposed to just the list view. Okay. <coughs> um, Last thing, you'll also see right down here in the bottom right hand corner, it'll say close window after starting import. That'll close the window for you to import and it'll start, you'll start seeing everything start to populate inside of your, inside of your computer. Okay? Um, if you want to uncheck mark that and just wait till everything's imported, you can, but for the most part you want to make sure that's check marked so you're good to go. Okay, let's go ahead and close out of that window by going to the upper left hand corner and clicking on the red X and close out of that. Okay? Right now you guys have no footage in there. What you guys will be spending time doing, not today, but next class period, is either taking pictures of your storyboard and importing them utilizing your phone, or um, you will uh, be creating storyboards like, we're gonna, like I'm gonna show you today. So we have digital storyboards added in so you can see how your film is pacing, okay? So before we do that, I wanna finish going over all these windows so that we kinda know what else is in front of you. Go, Derek. Is this gonna be like a group? Individualized, because your first project's gonna be individualized. Okay, it's just like what we did with the, uh, with the um, uh, story outline, story treatment, and so on and so forth, except it's by yourself. It's a good question. Okay. So <clears throat> if, you wanna, if you want to generate or create different things, you have to kind of know your way around the space. So let me, go, let me work our way around the space. Right here in the middle of your screen, you guys will see a, uh, a big black window. This is uh, what's used in order for you to see uh, a preview of your particular shot that you have. Okay, if you have stuff imported, you'll be able to import it. So right now, I'm going to import a video, just so that way you can see it. And I'm going to import this, this uh, football video. Okay, so that way I have it in here so you guys can see what it's like. Okay, I have this check marked, import selected, and you'll see it's importing. Now, when your footage is importing, you'll take a look at this particular check mark, and it'll tell you, if you click on it, it'll actually pop up a couple of things. It's popping it up here on my other screen. That's the reason why you're not seeing it. It'll tell you how much time it's taking when it's importing media. Okay, so if you don't want to see that, you can click the check mark. If you want to see it, you can click the check mark. Okay, either way, that takes it and kind of hides it, hides it away. So if you want to know if all your stuff is done importing, that'll let you know if you're done importing. I have a good check, so I'm good to go. Right? 
My footage is located right down here inside my viewer window. Well, I want to see it over here on, in this part. If I click inside of this particular image, you'll see that now I can see that image over here on the right-hand side of the screen. Okay? If I click at different points along the way, it'll take me to specific frames, but it is not playing the image or playing the video for me. What do I have to hit in order to start playing the video? Space bar. So let's hit space bar. Okay. And so you'll see when I hit space bar, it starts playing. When I hit space bar again, it stops. If I want to go forward or backwards one frame, left arrow, right arrow. I can hold down the arrow and you'll hear the clipping. Okay, as we're moving from one frame to the next, but you'll be able to kind of see how that stuff works just based on that. Okay, well, let's say I want to import this, uh, this video at a very specific point. I want to set my endpoint at the very beginning of this shot. Okay, I can use my left and right arrows to find the first frame of that particular shot. Cool, I found it. And now I can set my endpoint. What do I hit in order to set my endpoint? Just a, a quick little hint on it. It's literally the first letter. Yep, I. So if I hit the letter I, watch what happens to this yellow bounding box over here on my preview window. Okay, I'll go back. I'll redo that again so you guys can see it. By the way, if I want to undo something, what do I hit? Command Z, right? So if I hit Command Z, it'll undo that. Or if I want to change that, I can hit Option I. It'll clear my endpoint. Okay, if I hit the letter I, it'll cut to where my, where my uh, marker is okay, as, I, as I'm editing. Okay, so that's my endpoint. Well, I only want this shot. I don't want the other shots that come after it. So I can hit space bar to let it play. And you can see it move to the next thing. Well, I missed it. I'm gonna go back using my left and right arrows. Okay, to find the last frame, I'm gonna go forward till I see that frame, then go back one frame, and then set my out point by hitting what letter? O, oh, sweet. So if we hit the letter O, you'll see that now it looks like I have an in and an out point, but it's very, very small. This clip is very, very tiny, right? I can't quite see it all in there. But if I were to play this in my preview window, I would be able to see it in there, okay? So now that I've set an in point and an out point, how in the world am I gonna get this down to edit, okay? The way I can get this down here in order to edit it is by zooming in on this particular image. Now, right now it's just one image. If you want to adjust or change how that image looks, you can go up here to the top and click on this film strip. And you'll see that there's a time marker for you to, to change. Right now, it's set to every 30 seconds, it'll create a new image. Okay? If I, the slower I make it, you'll see the more images, the more screenshots, like YouTube, it'll make. So that way I can actually see I'm zooming in on a particular mark. And you can see this in point and out point that I created earlier got bigger. Okay. So now that I have that, I can click out of it, and I can drag this down to my timeline, and I can drop it in there. Now that's one way to get it down there. Another way to get it down there is by utilizing these options over here on the left-hand side. Now there's little markers that tell you exactly what it is that it does. So the first one says connect the selected clip to the primary storyline. Inside of your storyline or your timeline down here, this black bar is your primary storyline. That's where you want to drop most of your footage that contains audio and video. You can build layers up on top of it, or you can build layers down underneath of it, but this is the primary storyline. Okay, so when I drag, I can either click on this and say, I want to connect this to the selected clip in the primary storyline, but that's not going to work because I don't have a clip down here inside the storyline yet. The next option I have is uh, I can insert the selected clip in the primary storyline. That's not necessarily going to work for what it is that I want to do. Or it might work for what I want to do. Okay. The third option I have is to append or to add to the end of the primary storyline. And the last option I have is to overwrite the primary storyline when I add my clip in. So right now, I just kind of want to add it in. So if I want to add it in, I can hit the letter W. Now, how do I know I can hit the letter W? Yeah, if you take a look, if you take a look up here on the screen, you'll see that when I hover over that particular icon, it pops up with information so that way I can utilize it or in a, at the end, it gives me a keyboard shortcut. So if I want to drag and drop that down, rather than using my mouse to go over and drag and drop that down, I can just hit W 
and it inserts it into this primary storyline right at where my marker is. Now you'll notice that because my marker was a little bit further along, it had to create this black space right here, right? So, so that created that, that black space in there. But if I wanted this specifically to be added in just to the end of the storyline, I'd actually hit the letter E because there's nothing here to start with. So if I hit the letter E, because that's what the keyboard shortcut is for this, it adds it in right there at the beginning after my last clip. Much faster, much easier than going up here, dragging this, trying to drop it down here, and trying to make sure things are lined up. Okay? So right now, you guys have no footage to really use. Right? So you can't necessarily make those particular edits. Right? What you can do, though, is you can actually begin to generate your own clips. And that's what I want to do next, is to show you guys how you can generate your own clips so you can start dropping stuff down here into the storyline. Right? So for you guys, you can go back over here into Final Cut Pro. You'll see there's three icons up here above the library window. The first one that you have is your library sidebar, your library window. The next option you have is the photos and audio sidebar. Go ahead and click on that. Okay. Right now, you guys only have two options, or sorry, three options. You don't have a third option, or sorry, a fourth option, which is what I have, which is photos. The reason why you don't have photos is because you've never imported anything into the photos application, so that's not going to pop up up there. But anything that you've imported into photos, GarageBand, or iTunes will show up automatically in this sidebar. Okay, so if you want to click on the other ones, you can kind of see what you have available. Nothing's probably been imported into iTunes. Probably nothing's really been imported into GarageBand or Photos. You should, though, uh, or you might, though, have sound effects in there. If you don't, that means stuff hasn't been loaded into library because it's brand new. Okay, so that's this middle, that's this middle tab, this middle sidebar. The last sidebar on the right is the one that we're looking for, and that's called Titles and Generators. Go ahead and click on that. Inside of Titles and Generators, this option will allow you to generate video or create titles. Now there's a bunch of presets that are already available in here for you. Okay? They are sectioned out according to how Final Cut Pro views that particular element. Now I have some more elements than you do because I've downloaded more titles and imported them into Final Cut Pro to be able to, to utilize and use. Okay? However, most of you guys have the very basics. So if you're ever looking for basic titles, you can go down here and find them inside of the titles folder. If you want to see all of them, you can click on titles. If you want to see a sub element of them, like credits, you can click on credits. You'll see there's a bunch of different options for you to choose under titles or under generators. If you remember what I mentioned before, I talked specifically about how you can actually begin to import, or, or not import, but create storyboards inside of Final Cut Pro. That is located under the Generators tab. So if you click under Generators and scroll down, you will see that there's a bunch of different options for you to view. One of those options is Placeholder. Okay, so find the option that says Placeholder and then single click on it. Okay, so make sure you're clicked on Generators. Scroll down, it's in alphabetical order you should find one that says placeholder. If you can't find it, there is a search bar in the upper right hand corner. You can start typing in PLA and you'll see it'll pop up with just placeholder. Okay. When you click on placeholder, you'll notice that this is now acting like a clip. You don't have any media inside of your folder yet or inside of your project yet, but you do have this placeholder. Okay. What's really cool about this placeholder is if you move forward or backwards, you can set endpoints or out points for that particular video because it is a placeholder. It is generated content done by the application or the software. Okay, and we can use this as placeholders. Now, what's really cool about this is you can see how much time is passing as you scrub your mouse back and forth by taking a look at the middle of your screen. The way we read time code is from right to left. So on the right, that tells you how many frames you have. If you move to the left, it's how many seconds you have. If you move further to the left, it's how many minutes. And if you move further to the left, it's how many hours. Okay, that's your time code. So what I want you guys to do is create a four second placeholder by setting the out point at four seconds. So go ahead and do that if you can. I'm gonna go ahead and do that on my end. I'm going to scrub along my, my timeline here as I'm scrubbing back and forth, moving left and right. Okay, I'm going to stop it where I see it stop at four seconds. 
Now for me, I got lucky because it stopped right at four seconds, but if I went past it a little bit, I can still place an out point there at this particular point in time, if I wanted to, okay, and be able to say, okay, I want to generate that much time. Now watch what happens when you try and click O or I for endpoints or out points on placeholder. Is anything happening? Is anything happening for you? No? Correct, because this is video that's being generated. So in order for us to adjust the endpoints and outpoints, we actually do have to drag this down into our timeline. So go ahead and drag, uh, drag placeholder and drop it down inside of your timeline in the primary story window and let go. Okay. Now, you guys might get the option for it to pop up where it's asking you how do you want to set your timeline. Right? If you remember, we're basing it based on our first clip if we use automatic stuff. Our first clip is generated video. So because our first clip is generated video, you have to tell it what properties you want. Okay, so if I go back here, in my case, I drag video down. So I was able to set my project to uh, just based off my first video. If I wanted to do a new project, okay, and then drag some generated video down, like a placeholder, it's gonna ask me again, how do I want this set up? Your guys' basic framework you're working in is 1080p, 1920 by 1080, and your frame rate is 27.97. Okay, if you do that, you can go ahead and hit OK, and it will set your project settings accordingly. Okay. <clears throat> now you'll see down inside of your timeline your first clip. Okay. If you were to grab your marker, right here in the middle, your, uh, your little uh, yeah, marker basically, but that shows you where you're at. You can move that along the timeline. Okay, if you click that marker and drag it along the ruler that's right here, it'll tell you about where you're at in your video. Okay, if you wanna go one second forward, or sorry, one minute forward, you would see zero, zero frames, zero seconds, one minute. Okay, if you wanna zoom in a little bit more than that, you have to use a different tool in order to zoom in more. I'm going to go over those tools here in one second. But does everyone already have this so far? Okay. <clears throat> okay. We want to shorten this down to four seconds. Right now, it is currently 10 seconds long. It has zero frames and then 10 seconds. We've got to shorten it down. Now, one way we can do that is by dragging this end. You guys can go ahead and do this. Dragging this end and dropping it down to four seconds. Or as close as possible, as close as we possibly can to four seconds. That's one way to do it. Or you can use a different tool and cut to a very specific part and then delete the rest of it out. If you want to utilize more tools, that's what this next option is over here in the middle of your screen on the left hand side. If you click the down arrow next to the mouse pointer, you will see that you have the option for eight or sorry, seven different tools inside of Final Cut Pro. You have a selection tool, you have a trimming tool, you have a position tool, you have a range tool, you have a blade tool, you have a zoom tool, and you have a hand tool. Okay, Let's go ahead, and by the way, next to each one of them, you have the keyboard shortcut for how to access each of those tools so that we don't have to move your mouse up to the top and click on stuff and so on and so forth. Okay, So what I want you guys to do is go ahead and click on the zoom tool. Okay, So we're going to click on the zoom tool. If I ever wanted to go back to the selection tool, I can just hit the letter A. So right now I'm on the zoom tool. Watch what happens to my mouse. Okay, my mouse is gonna change from a magnifying glass to a pointer because I hit the letter A. If you hit the letter Z, go ahead and hit the letter Z on your keyboard, it'll switch to your zoom tool. Okay, so those keyboard shortcuts are gonna help you out a lot as you're able to move around Final Cut Pro. If you hit the B tool, it changes to a blade. If you hit the T tool, it changes to trim. Like, there's a lot of different options available to you. This is why keyboard shortcuts are, again, are really, really important, okay? But we're on our Z tool, we're on our zoom tool. If we wanna zoom in, we can now take our mouse and click down over where that placeholder is and scroll using our mouse so we can zoom in closer on a particular clip, okay? So go ahead and zoom in closer on your placeholder clip. And you'll see as you do, your timeline expands and it gets bigger, right? Because we're getting closer to it. Anyone want to guess how we zoom out? Because if I wanted to zoom out now, I can't zoom out, right? It's a little bit of a problem. <clears throat> so if you want to zoom out, you can hold down the Option key 
which is down at the bottom of your keyboard. And you'll see when you hold down the Option key, it changes the plus on your magnifying glass to a minus sign. And then you can click, and you can start zooming back. Okay. Eventually, the icon will go away completely, and that's how you know you're zoomed all the way out. Right? But that allows you to zoom in or to zoom out. Typically, when your item zooms, it's going to zoom closer to where your marker is that you're editing with. Right? Okay. Well, we want to shorten this down to about four seconds. So we're going to zoom in as far as we can. Not as far as we can, but zoom in a little bit more. And then we're going to go back to our selection tool by hitting the letter A. Okay. And we're going to drag the end of that particular clip so that way it lines up right at the four second mark. Okay. And then when you let go, boom. You have a four second clip now instead of a 10 second clip. Okay. This is the very basics of creating an edit or a cut, <clears throat> right? We can do this without video. We can storyboard it and paste it out inside of here. And then when we actually start creating our own video, we can create a new project and start dropping in our video. Okay. Now, so I place one storyboard, but I have more than one storyboard. So I need to go back and place another. Okay. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to drag another placeholder down into, into the timeline. Now you'll notice when I drag and drop it down, there's this blue bounding box that appears in the middle. When you have an element or an option called snapping turned on, it will automatically snap and align one clip to the next. Okay. So you'll see, I'm going to go ahead and drop this down here. It doesn't matter where I drop it in here. If I let go, it's going to snap it and put it in place. Okay. If you want to know if snapping is enabled, you will find it over here on the right hand side of your screen and it will be marked in blue. If you hover over it, it'll tell you what it is and that's snapping. Okay. If I want to drag down a clip and I don't want it to snap in place, I can go over here and click on this to make sure it's not blue anymore. Or I can hit the letter N and that'll take it on or turn it off and then drag down my placeholder. And when I drag down my placeholder, you'll see it won't necessarily snap to the end anymore. At least it's not supposed to. Yeah, there you go. Okay, it's not going to snap anymore to the end. The only reason why it's going to snap to the end is if I go off to the side. Okay, if I have it this way, it's not going to snap and I can be more precise with where I drop it. So if I let go, it'll drag and drop it right where, where my mouse was hovering over. Okay, for the most part, you're going to want snapping turned on. So make sure that snapping is blue. Exactly, Antoine. Okay. So that way when you drag and drop your item down here, drag and drop it inside of the timeline, it'll snap it and line it up to make sure everything is set. Okay. For this next shot, we're going to make it two seconds. Okay. So go ahead and drag the end. Uh, four plus two equals six, right? And so if you want to make sure that your shot is two seconds, you want to make sure that it lines up and that your time in the middle of the screen equals six. Okay. Now what's really interesting is when you're dragging the edges of these clips, you'll see that there's time code that pops up here right near the edge of the mouse. That time code on the left tells you how long your clip is. On the right is the adjustment, either the plus or the minus that you're adding or taking away from that particular clip. Okay. So it says right now on mine, it says two seconds on the left and it says I'm not adding or taking away any frames. If I go forward a little bit, it says my total clip is three seconds and 14 frames. And by doing what I'm doing, I'm adding 14, uh, uh, one second and 14 frames to this particular clip. Okay. Once you've set this up, now you have two clips down in your timeline. Okay. This is the very basics of beginning to build and edit inside of Final Cut Pro. You have one clip placed after the other. Do I have any questions so far before I move into my last thing that we're going to do for the last five minutes of class? Okay. I know you guys are going to need time to play with this. You're going to have time next class period in order to really understand it and play with it a little bit more because you're going to create your egg story or a storyboard inside of Final Cut. But I wanted you to kind of start to see how this stuff is set up and kind of put together. Okay. <clears throat> Last thing I want to do. Okay. If I take my marker right here and drag it all the way back to the beginning and I hit space bar, it'll play my video. <clears throat> You'll see the marker move along the timeline and it'll move from clip to clip and shot to shot. But you'll notice that my second shot is not the same as, or is the same as my first. 
I don't want it to be the same as my first shot. I want it to be different. That's where the inspector window comes into play. So click on your second shot, on your second clip inside of your timeline, and you'll notice up here in the upper right-hand corner, you have your inspector window. Now there's a bunch of different tabs that are available to you up here in the inspector window, a bunch of different options. Conversely, there's a bunch of different options that we haven't covered yet that are available here in the middle of the screen that you guys can explore a little bit more when you start utilizing this program, program a little bit more. But this inspector window has all the items that you wish to inspect or change about a particular clip available to you. If you go all the way to the left-hand tab right now, that is the generator inspector. Click on that particular tab. You'll see when you click on that tab, it switched the parameters that were inside of the inspector window. And you'll see that when you click on each individual tab, it'll change those parameters, okay? There's different things that are available to you. We want to utilize the generator part because we want to change what this shot looks like. We want to generate a different shot. So if you go under framing, which we talked about, you'll see that you have about four different options to choose from, a long shot or a wide shot, a medium long shot or a medium wide shot, a medium shot and a close up. Okay, you can choose uh, whichever one you want to. I'm gonna choose a close up, so that way it changes what my shot actually looks like. Now if you take a look at my screen, it didn't change it. The reason why is because my marker is not hovering above that particular frame. I need to hover over that particular shot in order to see the changes that I'm making to that particular clip or to that particular shot. You can still make the changes without being hovered over it, you just can't see them. Okay, so if I change this back to a medium long shot or whatever, when it was a close up, when I drag my marker back over, it actually changed it, so I'll do a medium long shot, right? Conversely, if I were to change it with something over here, you can click on close up and it'll generate as a close up. Okay, there are more options available to you underneath of that. So how many people are there? There's zero, one, two, three, four, five. So you get more option. What gender is the person? Is it a man? Is it a woman? How do you want to set up? What kind of background do you want? An office building? A suburb? Like what kind of stuff do you want? A sky? Is it a sunny day? Is it a clear day? Is it sunrise? Is, there an, is it an interior? Is it not an interior? Okay. There are different options available to, available to you so you can build a storyboard and start figuring out how long your story is progressing before you ever shoot video. This is the animatic that we were talking about at the very beginning when it came to Lord of the Rings. Okay, when we were to take a look at our storyboards. This is how you can kind of start building a story and putting stuff together without footage. So this is where we're gonna start. In next class period, I'm gonna give you guys time to start adding in music. We're gonna start adding in uh, uh, different other items. If you wanna utilize your actual storyboards, I'll show you guys how you can import them utilizing your phones. But this is kind of where we're going to start. Now the last thing I want to do is go over what you're supposed to do when you're done editing for the day. Okay, when you're done editing for the day, this saves automatically as you're going along. You do not have to hit Command S. You will not be like how I was last night where I was editing for two hours and because I didn't hit Command S inside of a particular application or program, I lost everything I was working on, right? And I had to rebuild it from scratch. This allows you to do it inside of the actual particular program. So if you go inside of this uh, program and you want to quit out of a program or to get rid of it, we don't just go up and close the window because that doesn't quit the program or the application. Okay, we have to quit the application. So if we have to quit the application, what keyboard shortcut are we going to use? Command Q. So hold down Command and hit the letter Q. And you'll see that when you do that, it'll quit out of the application. Now if you want to open it back up and see if your stuff is there, just go on back down to your dock, click on Final Cut Pro, and see if it pops all back up the same way that you were editing from before. If the answer is yes, cool, you have everything that you were working on before, everything's saved. This creates auto saves every 20 minutes in case something crashes or we have a power surge. So in theory, you'll never have to go back more than 20 minutes, but this is available to you. If you do not quit out of the application and someone comes in like you guys had today where someone was supposed to be at a particular machine and supposed to quit out of the application and didn't, I will go back in and deduct your grade because every time that someone doesn't exit out or quit out of the application properly, someone else has to wait for that computer to be restarted, which means it takes away from their time to edit. So make sure, because I know where everyone's sitting, I have a seating chart for stuff, make sure you quit uh, the application anytime you're going to use it, okay? We'll jump on this a little bit more tomorrow and then give you guys some more options and some more things to be able to do, but this is where we're gonna start for right now.
Jay, step off to the side, please. I didn't, I didn't dismiss class yet. Okay. Um, so uh, tomorrow we're going to discuss this a little bit more and kind of go at it a little bit more to kind of get some of this stuff. If you need to log out, you can go to the Apple button in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. But these are the options that you have available to you. And this is kind of where we're going to start for our editing, uh, for editing our projects here in class.